Um, well, thank you everyone for joining uh, today's webinar, Supporting Students and Navigating Trauma, Grief, Stress, and the Impact on the College Going Process. My name is Melissa Caperton, and I serve as the Director of Regional Impact at My Future NC. Uh, for those of you not familiar with our organization, we are the statewide nonprofit that is focused on achieving the state's attainment goal um, that 2 million North Carolinians between the ages of 25 and 44 will have some form of post-secondary prudential or degree um, by the year 2030. As we and our students um, navigate our third academic year um, that's been impacted by the pandemic, I think each one of us recognizes the impact that it has had on our students, um, on their families, and on ourselves. Um, as you may know, in October of this year, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the Children's Hospital Association joined together um, to declare a national state of emergency in, in children's mental health. And I wanted to read just a bit from their declaration because I think they, they stated it so well. As health professionals dedicated to the care of children and adolescents, we've witnessed soaring rates of mental health challenges among children, adolescents, and their families over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, exacerbating the situation that existed prior to the pandemic. Children and families across our country have experienced enormous adversity and disruption, and the inequities that result from structural racism have contributed to disproportionate impacts on children from communities of color. Um, you may also be familiar uh, uh, that the um, COVID Collaborative, uh, which is a bipartisan group uh, co-led by two former um, governors, uh, just last week released estimates that 167,000 young people have lost a parent or a caregiver due to COVID-19, 167,000. And that number doesn't include our young people whose lives have been impacted by a, a caregiver who might have had COVID and, and are experiencing the long-term debilitating impacts of uh, COVID-19, who may have family that's dealing with loss of income and jobs, or our young people who have found themselves uh, serving the front lines during the pandemic. And we know that among the many impacts of the pandemic that the college going process itself has also felt the effects. Data from the class of 2020 and 21 show decreased rates in FAFSA completion and college uh, enrollment. To date here in North Carolina, our FAFSA completion rates uh, for the class of 22 are down 7% from where they were this time last year for the class of 21, which incidentally last year's rates at this time uh, we're down from uh, the year prior in, in 2019. So to say that we are very grateful to have our guests, Dr. Kara Aiva and Dr. Laura Owen joining us today to walk through this critical topic would be uh, a, a severe understatement. Before I introduce um, our presenters, I just wanted to do some quick logistics. Um, we are recording today's webinar. We will make it and the resources that we share today available to all attendees by email uh, in the coming days. If you need tech support um, during the webinar, my friend and colleague Chris Charbonneau is available to help. Her email is listed there or you can reach her um, in the chat. Everyone is on mute, but we encourage you all to ask questions um, uh, in the Q&A. Um, a, a function of the webinar, which is down at the bottom, or if you have comments that you'd like to share, feel free to do that in the chat. Uh, and with that, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce our two amazing speakers for today's webinar. Uh, Dr. Kara Aiva, who uses the pronouns she, her, hers, is an associate professor in the Counseling and Educational Settings Program at uh, Rowan University. I wanna say Rowan, Rowan University. Her educational career spans over 20 years as a former Spanish teacher, administrator, and professional school counselor and counselor educator. She uses her research for advocacy by using asset-based approaches to empower student agency while promoting equity and wellness, both academic and mental health. Her interests include social emotional development, group counseling, post-secondary and career development, and she consults and delivers professional development nationally to pre-K 
through 12 school counselors, teachers, and administrators on strategies for cultivating a safe, equitable, and inclusive mental health and neurodiverse cultural, culture in schools. Thank you, Kara, for joining us today. Uh, and Dr. Laura Owen is the Executive Director for the Center for Equity and Post-Secondary Attainment at San Diego State University. Uh, a prior urban school counselor and district counseling supervisor. She's passionate, um, a passionate advocate for closing college opportunity gaps. Her research focuses on evaluating the impact of interventions and programs designed to address the system structures and policies that drive equitable access to high quality post-secondary advising support. She has uh, researched interventions targeting financial aid and FAFSA completion, the high school to college transition, text messaging, virtual advising, um, the impact of technology on college going decisions and how students prefer to receive career and college information. Uh, she is committed to the discovery of advising models that support access, retention, and completion of post-secondary credentials aligned to the workforce and connected to high wage, high demand jobs. Kara, Laura, we are thrilled to have the opportunity to learn and engage with y'all today. Thank you for joining us and sharing your expertise. And I will go ahead and turn things over to you. It would be helpful if I unmuted, I know. Uh, thank you. Um, we are uh, excited uh, to be here. I apologize, I have a very needy dog at the moment, apparently, so you might hear her cry. Um, but I do wanna take this opportunity to thank you for being here. Um, I saw in the chat that this is an important topic and we just want you to know that, you know, we're here to support you through this process uh, because we understand uh, what you are also up against. Um, feel free uh, to ask questions in the chat. We will try and uh, answer them as we go along, but we will also um, have room at the end for questions and answers. Um, so thank you for being here today with us. Uh, I think that was a great intro, so I'm not really gonna go into this, but you can see we, we were pandemic uh, pet uh, owners. Uh, so we have a micro, a mini micro golden doodle who that's who you hear crying. Um, and then this is my wife and our two children. Uh, we have also navigated mental health and neurodiversity uh, throughout their lives. Um, and I also do run college access programs, uh, pre-college programs for middle school and high school. And so my passion's there. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about wellness. So I will tell you prior to the pandemic, uh, you can see I was a triathlete. Uh, and all those coping skills went out the, the window during the pandemic. And so I just want you to all to know I'm still working on trying to find back what my coping skills are, uh, as some of you might also be facing. Um, so we, I personally do we give every uh, professional development with these three things, uh, and they are assumptions about all of you. Uh, we care, self-care, educare. The first is that you're here for all students, obviously in the positions that you are in. It's hard to do this work without that love of doing this. Also, I know we hear this all the time and we're gonna talk about mental health today and its impact, but um, wellness is what keeps us ha to have the ability to be able to help our students. And so uh, we keep hearing these words, wellness and self-care, but what really does that necessarily mean for all of us can be different. Uh, and then that you're here to continue to learn and grow so you can meet uh, our students where they are and the challenges that they're ultimately facing and that, that there's always a keen eye on equity and inclusion. So uh, if you are inclined uh, to either go to this website, I'm also, um, I would put it in the chat too, uh, but to put in that code number, we're kind of curious and want to take a pulse uh, to see where you are today. Uh, I will credit Pure Edge, which is a group here that does a lot of SEL uh, in the state of New Jersey uh, for the weather. Uh, I really like this because as we know, some days uh, are you know, minute by minute, the world changes right now. And so for all of us. Um, so if you are able to either use a QR code on your phone or type in uh, the web code, I'm just getting a pulse of where everyone is today. <laughs> all right. Oh, okay. Hmm. 
I mean, I'm going to admit it's been a long time since I've had over 50% in a sunshine uh, perspective. So I'm going to take that as it's holiday season. And for some right now, that might mean uh, a little more to you for others, maybe not. And so we understand minute to minute it changes. Uh, and so just because you're sunshine right now doesn't mean you're sunshine when this ends. Uh, and we will still have those questions and answers to be able to process. So thank you for all of you who participated in that. I'll move in, I promise. <laughs> All right, so today we are gonna talk about kind of the framework for working with these students. We're really gonna talk about uh, how to manage the multiple traumas that students are facing and what that looks like on uh, post-secondary work. And we really are gonna uh, refocus and bring this back to how you're doing. Uh, we do know that relationships matter, the work that you do matters. Uh, and so your wellness also matters um, in this process. So what you're looking at right now is a response that a colleague and I came up with um, uh, when the pandemic originally hit. And for those of you, uh, most of you are all in North Carolina, but in the state of New Jersey, we don't have anyone who oversees school counseling in our state. And so we really had to come together as a group in the entire state and work together. And one of the reasons we wanted to show this to you um, is because you'll notice it's an inverted kind of uh, pyramid similar to MTSS in a way, and that it still matters that you have to take care of you before being able to build out to do all of these things. Um, and so, you know, I look at virtual norms or things like that. That's not necessarily, this is all necessarily working right now. Um, those things are already in place for you, um, but that self-care is still important and understanding the resources around you. Um, we know that some of our resources in our community are depleted, but some have also come on board and very new. Uh, and so to just kind of remember that, uh, that there are others out there in your community to be able to support you, but realistically from a consultation and a collaboration standpoint uh, and really seeking consultation, one of the things that uh, we don't have in school counseling and then as college access professionals is a lot of times we don't have uh, supervision in the sense of what our students are necessarily dealing with. Um, from a mental health perspective, a lot of it is very administrative in nature. And so it kind of sets the stage for we need to take care of ourselves. And then we have to understand the resources that are in the community for our students. So then that we can start assessing what our students need and to move forward. And I do want to point out um, that our students' futures and being able to dream about that future is a really part of the process of healing and moving forward. And so while some of us may not be necessarily sunshiny today, and I appreciate um, you being honest, it does also mean that um, our students uh, and all of us really need something to look forward to and working through this process as overwhelming as it can be on its own without the pandemic and the multiple traumas, they do need our support, but they also need to look forward to this process um, as we move forward. And so we do know that this is a really difficult process for everyone. Uh, you are on, on charted waters, as we would say, and there's more and more that's come up that we might have never had to uh, either assess or intervene. And we know that mental health of our students really comes first before we engage in this process. But we wanna take this time to let you know, we understand on a larger scale how difficult this is and on a day-to-day -day in and out. Um, I like to show this visual because, uh, you know, everyone really doesn't necessarily know where they are, including our students. And so our students, including ourselves, might have already had past trauma, uh, but between the stress and I'm going to call some of the inconveniences of COVID, like, you know, uh, I need to get tested or I need to be in quarantine or all the added responsibility from a, just a physical health perspective uh, on top of the stress, on top of any, uh, any bad news that you come in contact with. And then it takes something small uh, and people really don't understand that. We know that a lot of people are at what we call a breaking point, uh, but we also know we wanna see people thrive. So how do we move from this place and space of being in survival uh, and trying to juggle all of those things 
um, which we can't, to be honest. We have to address some of those things and not juggle before we can move forward. And that includes our students' mental health and what they're also bringing to you. That really does take precedent sometimes so that we, they don't end up in situations like this. Because one of the things that we're starting to see a lot in schools specifically uh, is a behavior uh, and part of it is, is not really being able to interact, but into this visual being very overwhelmed. Um, uh, this is really, uh, as you can tell, I'm a visual storyteller. Um, this was a, uh, a Facebook post and I want to be clear, this was really early on, uh, you know, about how many, uh, you know, suicide assessments and, uh, teacher consultations and parent consultations and things that are happening, particularly for people who work so close to students, um, as you do. And we know that the day in and day of that can be, have a wear and tear. Uh, and and really, uh, it's just continuing on top of responsibilities that you already have. And so we also know, just like I just preached to you, right, that we get all of these informations and newsletters from our school about how we need to be well and we need to have take care of ourselves. And then the next minute, uh, we get another email asking us to be able to do something else, right? Um, we do know, and just so everyone knows, that uh, domestic violence, substance abuse, and obviously mental health, and even referrals to the Department of Ch Children and Family Services, um, whatever the equivalent is in New Jersey, is on the rise. And what's interesting is it started to be on the rise during the pandemic when we were all virtual. And that is scary in two ways. One, because we weren't in school and we didn't have the everyday check-ins that they would typically have. So that also means these statistics are actually coming from hospitals, right? Which means it's also gotten that far um, and or communities. Um, and we are really seeing an increase in substance abuse, both at the adolescent level and the adult level. And that's because when you can be virtual, there is not someone who's checking in on you on a daily basis. And so our substance abuse facilities are reporting that uh, the, the people who are coming in don't look like any, any other people that they've had in all of these years, right? So it can, it can hit anyone at this moment in time. Um, and so it's just, it's important for us to know when we're also working with students, uh, because if this is on the rise, then so are the experiences of some of the, one, of the students that you're working with. Um, if you don't already, uh, we'll talk a little bit about this, but signs and symptoms of anxiety, depression are uh, one of those things that we've always been taught to look for, both from a physical aspect and a behavioral aspect. Um, but I think one of the things that we're also seeing in schools is that there's all different types of behaviors. And right now, what's really hard to discern is, is it an emotional overload? Is it a mental health issue? Is it neurodiversity? Is it ADHD? And all of them have similar symptoms right now. Uh, and so schools are having a really hard time how to parcel that out, which also means for all of you, uh, having to put some of those pieces together is pretty difficult. Uh, the human connection and why. So what I'm saying to all of you is, to really go back and, and think about your why, uh, because uh, Dr. Owen and I had this conversation last night that, you know, connecting is one of the reasons we got into, these field, into this field, and it seems like for a long time we were disconnected, and so any way that you can go back and ask about your why, because uh, it might seem hard. You might feel like you're not getting anywhere with students and your students might feel the same way. Uh, but that connection that you have is really important. And then I would add on top of all of this, and I already talked about the kind of the inconvenience, right, of all the things that are happening in schools that also have kids disconnected, uh, and not just between masks and social distancing, but all the policies and procedures and protocols that are in place that also distract from uh, what I will call some of the fun stuff about school, uh, and as well as connecting with one another. And you should know that at the high school level, specifically, we are seeing students students really don't know how to interact with one another. And so if they don't know how to interact with one another, they're also going to have a hard time interacting with you. Uh, and they don't know how to ask for help for what they need right now. Uh, and so just to give you this rainbow of where people are, we do have some students who are still in survival mode, drowning, or sometimes we don't even know where they are. 
um, they're just existing. And then we do have some students are thriving. And so all of you, as you are working with these individuals are really looking at a plethora, right? Of all of these feelings. Um, some, some have taken uh, what has happened. They've kind of regrouped, reinvented and have gone forward. And others are really still, uh, you know, feeling sad, lonely, and isolated. And I, I, I will admit, I am married to a, a middle school science inclusion teacher, and she comes home every day with different stories. Uh, and the stories are more along the lines of being in the middle, but the communication piece, they, they say things like, I want friends, but I don't know how to interact right? Um, the only way that they know how to interact is through texting and things of that nature and not necessarily how to do that in person. Um, and so I believe that's also going to come across when you're also working with your students. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, uh, anxiety does look very different for so many people. Um, some people, you know, we've talked about this previously, but um, Dr. Owen and I always talk about, we know how stressed we are when we can't sleep, right? Like that's the number one thing we know, uh, but we don't necessarily see all these other things that happen, you know, our anger over something little that happens, uh, going from zero to 60, losing patience, losing focus. And sometimes you think it's all about you and not necessarily what could be going on for you emotionally. Uh, and I will admit I have been caught in that, uh, myself probably quite a few times here uh, during this pandemic. And it's interesting, I don't know what all of your cultures look like, but we do still have some students who are very extremely worried about COVID. And in all honesty, now the flu, as people keep talking, because what we don't know is how students internalize all of this information. And because we're not, they are not connecting with their peers, right? And they may or may not be connecting with other adults. We really don't know where they're processing all this information. So some people were really scared on the onset of COVID and that's never wavered. And so when we're thinking about um, this, co the college planning and career planning process, that's still actually plays a factor for them. And Dr. Owen's going to talk a little bit about her survey results. Um, and just another way of looking at this, I think the reason why I'm also sharing this is the clinginess. Uh, we have found a lot of people are not willing to go out of a comfort zone. And that comfort zone becomes geographical right now. Uh, there's a lot of less people who, uh, and this is the adults in their lives too. So some of this is students themselves, but some of it is also the adults. And so that does present a whole nother barrier uh, in ways and, and probably more it has in the past, but more so because of what's happening with the pandemic. Um, and we're going to talk about the developmental regression, obviously. Uh, this person has peed in their in their pants or in their bed. Uh, that these are common aspects for people to actually uh, digress. Um, and what's interesting also is the play. So just as much as our older kids, our younger kids are having a hard time figuring out what play looks like anymore, uh, because for a long period of time they weren't necessarily playing with others. And so you can see how that across the continuum can expand. What I would like to talk about is how much loss there is, uh, because I don't think that we, you know, we, well, we didn't, the powers that be, uh, expected us to kind of somewhat try and figure out how to go back to what was. And that's really hard to do without addressing all of these things. And so I just want to put in perspective the pandemic, racial, racial injustice, all the elections, all the spotlight on schooling and school boards and critical race theory and DACA, right? The removal of DACA with our students uh, has caused an, an immeasurable loss, right? So during the pandemic and even still so because of safety features, um, our students lost a lot of rite of passages and milestones. So when the pandemic hit, people lost graduation ceremonies, they lost proms, they lost all of these things that they look forward to at one point. We know just based on, on, on how students are interacting, they lost access to friends. So they went from being what they believe to be highly social and connected to really being disconnected. 
And then especially for our high school students who are also more aware and they did lose access to really safety. So not just in, in, in their school environment, which is one piece of this, but also the global aspect of the world. Uh, it, you know, they've kind of had to wake up to this fact that we've lost safety. Um, they've, which then in turn also is a loss of innocence right? The more we know, the more information we get, the more students internalize, the more they are kind of uh, growing, right, in knowledge, but not necessarily the social maturity that comes along with it. They lost comfort, control, structure. You know, I, I honestly said to you, I lost, you know, uh, my coping skills, right? Because my coping skills somewhat had a structure into my everyday too that I'm still trying to figure out. And our students lost their structure and are just really trying to figure out what that is. And for our students who are in high school, uh, right now prepping um, as juniors and seniors, some of them were in middle school, right? Some were in ninth grade. And so there's a vast difference to what that structure looked like versus what it looks like now. And then really the rejection on some ways of what that structure was. Um, we talked about loss of visual check-ins. Um, um, the bottom three are really huge as far as identity development is concerned. And I think this is not something that uh, you've been, we notice, but don't necessarily pinpoint. So when students lost their right to freedom, right? And freedom means choosing to go out, to be with friends, right? Um, they also lost this ability for risk-taking. And I know that sounds, you know, positive in some ways, but risk-taking from, from an adolescent standpoint, both in middle school and high school also contributes to uh, their development and their maturity. And so as a result, we've lost this kind of identity development because they were not able to interact. You know, think about middle school and high school. You try on different hats, right? To figure out who you are, what speaks to you, what doesn't. And when they haven't really been given a chance and an opportunity to explore that. I'm going, Laura, I promise. And so what I would like to share with all of you is that this is grief, right? Um, we continuously think about grief of losing someone or a pet, but it's very clear that grief isn't just about death. It's about what we've lost. And as I've just mentioned, there's an immeasurable amount of loss and some that we can pinpoint or students can pinpoint for themselves and even us as professionals, but there are others that we can't, right? And so I show this visual to remind yourself one of the stages of what grief looks like and it is not fluid and it can go up and down just like the weather and checking in how we are on any given day. Um, but if you look at uh, that grief isn't just for death, right? Losing in your community and the certainty which goes along with that level of safety and it's we haven't really gotten it back yet because we're still on this influx people are still really in a grieving process both as adults and both as children uh, and it's really important uh, to remember that because they may not even be able to vocalize what it is. They know it's something, they can't attest to it physically, they can't describe it emotionally, but they know something is off. And part of that can be attributed, you know, to can be anxiety, right? But it can also be this aspect of anxiety based on grieving. And so, uh, as you know, uh, grief takes uh, many different forms and has many different paths through those stages, and it's just messy, right? But the reminder of that for all of you is when we have to prioritize mental health over what I'll say academic and prepping and career moving forward, because there is a point in time where if we don't address that grief, right? We students have the opportunity, including ourselves to end up, I wouldn't say opportunity, they could end up staying in a depressive state and that can be lifelong for them. And so we wanna make sure uh, that we are attending to the mental health piece um, so that we can get to this place in space where uh, acceptance isn't necessarily what we're looking for, but they're able to cope a little more uh, instead of being kind of under that, what is it, the x-axis, y-axis? See, that's why I'm not in math, people. It's just, it is. And so before we move on to kind of talk about a little bit about the, the impact, you know, we think about um, how our professionals have or have not even taken the time uh, to stop and reflect and to see what this this crisis was like for you. And so, uh, you know, there are a lot of questions in here, um, but I'm thinking for just a moment, if you pick one question and really reflect uh, with yourself about 
what it is uh, that might have have impacted you the most or what you've lost or gained, we'd really appreciate if you would like to share that in the chat. Please don't feel like you need to, but we do want to give a moment for you, one, to process what I just said, and two, to really think about your own experience before we move forward with thinking about how this work then impacts uh, with our students. <laughs> I just saw Laura that you let everyone know. Yeah, April, my reaction also was uh, uh, denial. Yeah, like this can't really be happening. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a really good point, right? And, and, you know, we, uh, we talk about in our field, the pandemic being one large adverse childhood experience. And we are going to feel that effects for the next 10 to 15 years, because that's what we know about trauma. So I really appreciate that, that comment that we really don't know, right? We just don't know what we've lost. Yeah. Mm hmm Identity because the job changed. That's a really good point. Uh, people were switched into different roles. Uh, and so you were learning on the fly. Yes. Rachel, I had the slide and I deleted it because it was too long about that freeze mode uh, flight responses. Uh, but you're right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, continuously watching uh, a survivor. I get that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, thank you for pointing that out, Chris, because I think, you know, a lot, racial injustice is still really at the forefront of what's happening. And I, I say this because it's at the forefront of what's also happening for students. Uh, and schools are, have not done a really good job of attending to that based on the outlash and the school boards and all of those things. And, you know, uh, at some point, we're also not taking to the account the cultural identities of all of our students and what they're facing uh, from in those multiple traumas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Amelia, I will also say that my first reaction in the first four weeks was uh, very similar, like, ooh, we don't have to go somewhere. I think I can do this. Uh, not really understanding what, what was happening at that moment of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I appreciate all of you who were willing to share those comments. I think um, what one of the things that we are doing in schools, and I really wanted to bring this to your attention to, to set this up for um, Dr. Owen to talk about the, the college uh, impact, the post-secondary impact, is that we really moved from trauma informed as a term to healing centered engagement. Um, and so for those of you who don't know Dr. Sean Jim Wright, he's the one who coined this phrase. And the rationale and why I'm saying this to you is because our students are a collection of so many things, right? So many identities, so much traumas, so much stories, so much joy, so much strengths, right? Um, and trauma in and of itself really uh, asks students what's wrong with you, right? As opposed to what's right with you. And so it's okay that people have experienced trauma, right? People have, sorry for my dog. <laughs> people have always experienced trauma and have been able to be resilient. I think one of the aspects of healing Saturday, I'm going to throw something. Is everybody going to be okay with that? <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> what happens when your office is at the front door? I'm almost through and then I can mute. Um, so one of the things that we, okay, there she's moving, that we are moving towards is really looking at how to heal collectively, right? As a community, uh, as our, with our students, with our families. And one of the most political acts is healing. Uh, but the other aspect I'm going to mention is taking into account 
um, cultural identity of students as we work through this process. I was actually reminded again yesterday uh, by some of our interns um, that I met with about how important cultural identity is to interpreting, interpreting what some of that trauma looks like for each of our communities and families. And as a reminder to all of us that we don't necessarily know Auburn's lived experience, the best that we can do is to be able to be supportive uh, in those moments. Um, um, because students, remember, they're part of this generation that needs instant feedback and doesn't understand that everything, not everything has a solution, everything is a process. And part of what we're trying to, to teach students in general is what those processes are so that they can redo them multiple times in their lifetime. So the process for post-secondary planning is something they'll continue to do again in their future but they have to know the steps. And I think one of the one of the things that we've been doing for so long is, you know, we take each crisis as it comes and we give solutions and keep moving. But just as a reminder that students don't always need solutions, they need connections and processes to move through this healing. And so now my colleague who has no power uh, is gonna come on uh, to share with you about where we go uh, with what is happening and then where we go from a post-secondary planning standpoint and then we're going to cycle back to all of you. Hi, everyone. It is great to be with you this afternoon. I'm going to try to put my camera on. I'm not sure how this is going to work. Uh, all I have is cell phone coverage right now, and my apologies, but you all know how to punt, and so do I. Um, I think that's part of uh, being in our profession and knowing how to adjust. If for any reason this gets really bad, somebody let me know and I'll turn my, I'll turn my camera off. Um, Kara, could you go ahead to the next slide? So one of the things that um, I have been working on is really trying to understand how the, post the, the pandemic is really impacting students' post-secondary choices. And I'm really curious, we've got a really nice group here today. Um, if you wouldn't mind just um, responding in the chat, what are some of the challenges that you see your students facing right now? And do you have any state or local organizations that you know of right now that are reaching out to disengaged um, high school graduates from the class of 2020 or the class of 2021. If you wouldn't mind um, sharing that in the chat, um, I would love to hear what you see as some of the biggest challenges for your students. Transportation, housing, employment. Um, disengaged means students who were academically qualified, had intended to enroll um, in a post-secondary institution uh, uh, during their senior year, but actually decided not to show up um, in the fall. So both from the class of 2020 and from the class of 2021. Um, we actually know right now from data coming out of the National Student Clearinghouse that for the national numbers for the class of 2020, um, direct high school to college enrollment dropped about 9.3%. Uh, and then for the class of 2021, it was about another 3% um, in addition to what we had um, seen in the decrease from the class of 2020. So absolutely um, just devastating to look at these numbers. And then when you disaggregate them a little bit further, you see that for students attending high minority, um, lower um, socioeconomic uh, high schools, that the decrease was even more significant. And a latest piece of data that's come out that a lot of people were wondering, will the class of 2020 re-engage in the process? Um, we actually, for the very first time, just a couple of weeks ago, saw the first data coming out for fall 2021 which only 2% of the class of 2020 that disengaged enrolled this fall. So alarming um, to actually see those numbers and to realize um, 
what's going on for a lot of students. So I wanna share just really quickly some data that we're seeing. Um, nationally, I appreciate all of the comments that you're giving me um, in the chat. I think a lot of what you're sharing are things um, that we're seeing across the country. And there was a really phenomenal study. Um, there's been several trying to understand what's happening during the pandemic, but Strata and the Gallup um, organizations did a study called Reconnecting um, Recent High School Grads with their, um, with their Educational Aspirations. And one of the things they asked them, what are three words you would use to describe how you feel about getting more education in your future? And you can just see from this word, Graham, you know, um, a mixture, right? You know, a lot that were excited, a lot that were worried. Carrie, you can go to the next slide. So I just was gonna sh um, share a couple of the, the quotes um, that some of the students gave. And this is a student class of 2021, um, disrupted. She's from West Virginia. She's working full-time. She's trying to provide financial support to her home. Her parents are, um, are not college. They don't have a college degree. And you notice, I mean, her words were confused, obligated, stressed. Um, she's not sure what she's gonna do. Um, she's really worried about debt. Um, she feels obligated because the only way she can make a livable wage is really to get more education, but she's very worried about her family and um, also concerned, did she do well enough in the last year with her grades to be successful in higher ed? I wanna go to the next one. I'll just share um, these two really quick. Um, here's another student, annoyed, overwhelmed, um, indecisive, angry that um, post-secondary education is so expensive, worried that this might not even get them to a, a job or a career that they want to go into, and maybe even it trains them for something that they're not even going to enjoy. Like unpacking all of that is incredible. And then here's a student who felt really optimistic. Um, trying to see the best in everything that had happened, going to learn um, and from the experience and feeling like things were going to work out. So really quickly, I'll go through this because I wanted to just show how deeply this is connected to mental health and well-being of our students. Every survey that we've looked at um, whether it's these national surveys, and I'm going to share a survey that we've been doing, really identifies this idea of stress, anxiety, um, mental health as being like the largest influence on their decision um, not to pursue more education. Um, and I, I think this is something that I'm sure, you know, you all are seeing um, with your students as well. Next slide. So one of the things that I think we would anticipate is that when we're looking at disrupted students who were from lower um, income family situations, they expressed that it was much more difficult for them to find information or to get help, um, whether that was information on financing their education, how to apply, um, how to know what the different options were that were available. You can see that it was different um, and, and more difficult and challenging for students um, who were coming from lower income households. This one, I think is a very telling slide. I actually think these numbers are even widening more. Um, this was done in summer of 2021. I think we're gonna see even larger deficits um, and gaps in what students perceive as the um, worth of a higher education um, based on the cost. And you can see while they still felt like it might help them get a good job, um, that they would be successful, you know, you're looking 70, 63%. Whether it was worth the cost drops all the way to 45%. And this is where we're hearing lots of students now who are questioning um, the value of higher education. Um, I think we can go through um, some of these next slides a little bit faster, but really the gist of the study that Strata and Gallup did was we can't let this crisis of disruption become a crisis of disengagement. And this is what we really are worried about in the post-secondary space now. So in addition to these national surveys, you can go to the next slide. Um, uh, really, when we hear students um, saying, like, what is it that they need? They're really wanting someone who can advise them, someone who can connect their education to career. Um, they wanna make sense of it. They wish that financial aid was easier. They want more help understanding career pathways and what their options are. 
And if you go to the next slide, Kara, you know, I think some of these recommendations are things we hear all the time. How do we make sure that the information is clear, um, that it's consistent? A lot of the students are saying, you know, I don't want to hear sort of the sound bites anymore. Please tell me like it is. Like I know already because I have siblings who got a degree and can't get a job in the area that they got a degree in. I have friends who've graduated with a lot of debt. They want transparency. Like they want to know this is what it's really like. Here's what the expectations are. And they feel like that um, they're being let down by advisors, uh, whether it's school counselors, college advisors that just try in their opinion to sell higher ed as the answer and not really addressing like some of the issues around higher ed and some of the barriers and some of the obstacles um, that they probably need to be thinking more about. And they would, they're really asking like, please tell us like it really is instead of what you think it needs to be. So we've been really involved um, through the Center for Equity and Post-Secondary Attainment in trying to understand how do we address this? How do we look at the number of students who intended to go to college, they were academically qualified, but they've made a decision not to enroll. So we're looking at how is it currently impacting their decisions? Then can we share tools and resources um, with school counselors, college advisors to understand how to address it? And can we you know, create a network of um, professionals who can make recommendations in real time? We don't assume anyone has all the answers now. As a matter of fact, if we think we do, I think we're, we're in trouble. So uh, we did a survey with um, the ACT Center for Equity and Learning, as well as a local survey. I'm gonna share some of the results from a, one local high school um, in San Diego. However, no, we have another 3000 students who took this um, nationally finding some of the same um, results. Go ahead and um, carry it to the next one. You're gonna get this slide and you can um, see some of this. We just wanted to share, you know, looking at the students, how many of them were planning to enroll in a trade or two-year or four-year program. This definitely skewed to a higher percentage of students who plan to enroll. So the students who weren't intending to enroll didn't fill out the survey as much. So I think that's really important for you to know as we go through this. Um, Kara, we're going to go through this fairly quickly. Um, FAFSA completion, this was exciting to see that most students um, reported that they did attend a workshop, that they got help with their FAFSA, and these are students who didn't attend in person for an entire year. So that was encouraging. Um, when you look at the number of students who um, reported, so 38% of our college-bound students reported that they'd made a change. 39% um, were planning to do a bachelor's. You can see these numbers, 64% were planning to enroll in community college. Um, and then we asked them to share why their first choice um, had changed. You can see the highest was cost of attendance, um, personal preferences, not you know, related to COVID. 21% um, school was too far from home. This really mirrored a lot of what Gallup found. Um, and then we had 18% that didn't get into their first choice. Again, here we asked um, some of the common things that we saw on other surveys that were being done, like how concerned were you um, because of COVID? You can see again how high uh, mental health is, that they were really afraid that they wouldn't be able to pay their non-education bills. Um, again, that real concern about like, will the job and my degree line up? Am I going to be able to get a job in the area um, that, that I want to get? And then we also saw, you know, afraid of getting um, COVID, afraid of um, learning online and not wanting to do that again. Go ahead to the next slide. So um, with the mental health concerns being the number one thing we saw, we really wanted to um, highlight both from a quantitative standpoint and from getting a little bit more qualitative data. And you can see some of these comments from students like, Although students don't talk about it often, mental health is a big problem for us. Having mental health breaks can help us, but also don't overload the work, especially if it's not an AP class or an advanced class or a college course. Um, really asking like the teachers to think about, um, we're going through this as well. And so sometimes the students are feeling like there's not a lot of understanding about how they're experiencing the pandemic. And if you go to the next slide, 
uh, we asked them like, what's the one thing you wish adults knew? And a couple of these, um, you know, when we heard these, it was just um, heartbreaking in some cases and, and made us kind of step back and think about, well, what are we doing? How are we really addressing this? Um, we're truly trying our best. Um, to get where we want to be, and it would be much appreciated if they understood that not all families function the same, and that some students carry greater responsibilities than others. Um, that we're new to things and just being pushed into adulthood. Um, there are things that would go over smoother with things like college and money and jobs if there was really proper guidance. So, and you know, feeling that they weren't um, able to get that. And so this was all from the class of 2021, and we will be publishing a report on that. And so um, we want to get to this last part, but I would really love for some of you, if you would just like identify, and let's just take one question. Um, how are you addressing mental health and how it's impacting the needs of your students um, while you're also trying to do college and career advising and post-secondary work? Um, I think that that is the question that is, you know, of utmost importance. I'm going to share in the chat um, when I'm done talking an article that just came out last week, and it was talking about the challenge of um, school counselors really trying to juggle mental health needs, um, SEL curriculum, while they're also trying to help students do their college applications. And now we're about to come into um, financial aid and FAFSA completion and uh, for us in California, the DREAM Act um, applications. And so really curious how you are um, juggling all that. I was also and, add to um, that. Dr. Owen, yeah, that I was with a group of students yesterday and one of the things in high school, one of the things they also said to us about this process is, you know, everyone always talks about what that next year is going to look like, right? And no one sits down to map out, I can't do this right now, but here are some other things that we can do. And then we can do this in year four and five. And they feel like they lose that support if they don't, if someone isn't making that plan in that moment with them. Yeah. And I think that one of the things, um, with the Kresge Foundation that was willing um, and interested in funding this um, research and this understanding is exactly that point. So the students who are disengaging, um, you know, higher ed institutions don't see them as their students to help necessarily re-engage them unless they started. So we are hearing higher ed institutions, if a student started and dropped out, that they are reaching back out to them and they're trying to help them. But they're not college, you know, high school students either. And high schools are overwhelmed with, you know, the current class of 2022 and all of the 9th, 10th, and 11th graders that are in the school. And so who really is seeing this need and going to form, you know, supports in the community or whatever needs to happen to really address this massive loss um, in the post-secondary process, I think is, is a huge um, issue. And so one thing, Kara, if you go to the, the next slide, we are now trying to understand in real time what is happening for the class of 2022. So when we surveyed the class of 2021, it was in the summer. And unfortunately, um, that meant that we got the data back from the class of 2021 after they had left high school. And getting that into the hands of counselors and college advisors in real time to help the class of 2021 was difficult. We've moved this up. We are, we are um, giving this survey now across the country. And um, we created a way for any student to take it. So you've got a link here that you could um, please encourage your high school um, seniors to take this survey. We really want to understand for the class of 2022 what is happening for them. And then we'll be um, analyzing this data and early spring getting this into your hands. So we're going to get it to college advisors. We're going to get it to school counselors so you can respond um, based on what they're telling us are their greatest needs and you can adapt your advising. We also built out because we are not seeing this anywhere, um, the parent perspective of how this is influencing their decisions. Now we heard on the student side, parents who were trying to encourage their students to stay home, parents who were worried um, about COVID, but we really haven't seen anyone survey parents um, to really talk about how 
um, the pandemic is influencing their, their child or the way that they're advising their child. So these are anonymous. Um, we're not asking any um, students. We don't want any identifiable information, but if you could share these, we would love to have um, hundreds of students and parents in North Carolina take this. So um, if you could do that, I promise you, we will get the data back to you as fast as we can. So uh, in cycling back to you, we just wanted to have this opportunity uh, to give you a mindful minute to remind ourselves, right, uh, that we do need minutes, right, in the same way that our students are asking for that, uh, and really compassion for ourselves and how our, to really be paying attention to what our mind, heart, and body uh, is really telling us and to really take that time. The other thing, um, and I'm going to flash forward uh, to this, is, is a reminder for your self-care, but a different lens, I think, is one of the best things that we can talk about for a moment, because I think it really talks about your mental health um, and our students. And, you know, for all of us who've learned about wellness over periods of time, this was typically uh, the wellness that we talked about, right? Uh, spiritual, physical, intellectual, emotional. We've added in the last few years, financial uh, aspects, and then both um, uh, and the environment, because I think one of the other things that is really uh, causing a lot of anxiety and concern is the environment uh, for our students who have, who have taken that on. But a different way to look at this as a reminder for those of you that potentially were trained in counseling for both your students and for yourselves, that uh, choice theory talks about five different uh, aspects of human basic needs. And the reason I'm sharing this is because this is a little more existential than it is very specific, right? It's about survival mode isn't just about, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It really is also about the psychological aspects of being safety. And when we talk about college planning processes and looking at the financial piece, people are not, people in survival mode are not going to take risks and taking on the burden of the financial aspect, potentially of post-secondary fits in that. Uh, the other is love and belonging to the extent in which you want to be connected with others. Uh, it makes a it makes a difference for how we decide uh, what we want and what we need, and do we stop and reflect? But that also plays true for our students uh, in that process of what they're willing to choose to do based on where they fall in the in this category. Um, Power, which we see uh, obviously is having influence potentially, but it is being recognized, uh, being good at what you do, uh, how your, your agency and self-esteem is linked into things that you are doing. And that makes a difference for the choices that we make for our wellness, but it also makes a difference for the choices for which our students were uh, make choices. Freedom is a huge part of that, right? Being independent and wanting to make those choices. And I think uh, there are time periods where we do want others to make choices for us, particularly when we are overwhelmed. And I think that's where our students are, uh, a lot of them. And so they don't know how to get to this aspect of freedom. And part of that is creativity. Part of that is choice. Uh, and there's a lot that's rolled into it. But if you stop and think about how much freedom am I allowed in my work or how much freedom am I allowed in my relationship and how do I change that to make happy? Those are different questions than looking at those everyday uh, aspects of the wellness wheel. And then fun. Now, for some of you who are extroverts, fun could be going out, humor, right? Uh, partying, celebrating. And for those of you, it could be reading a book. I will admit, I spend a lot of time playing solitaire to zone out my brain so that I don't have to engage with another uh, human being and don't have to listen to one more thing. Um, but I just, this is really a reminder to you about your own wellness, but this is really also about our students because we are making choices uh, to the point that was in the chat earlier that we really don't know long-term effects and yet we're forced to have to be in situations to make choices. The question is, how do we make those choices to fulfill our own wellness? And then how do we use that information to ask questions of our students so that they are making choices that are relevant for them as part of that process? Um, as you can see, at some point, we were going to have you decide uh, how you were doing and also um, uh, are, are you spending energy in places that you shouldn't necessarily? Uh, you know, are you living a balanced life? Um, 
Is it where you want to be? Do you want things to change? And I, I think we thought we would have time to go through that and process that because I think it's one of the things that we don't do often enough. We're so busy helping everyone else that we just really never take that time uh, to, to reflect. Um, and so with that, because we have a few more minutes, I thought maybe we could open it up to questions and answers. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, if folks, I know we are at time, but if folks have questions, we will um, stay on if that's okay, Karen and Laura, for a few questions if y'all have them, if you're able to stay with us. Um, but do know that these um, slides will be available to you by email um, in the coming days. And so uh, I do hope you will take some time to reflect on this amazing information that y'all have shared today. Thank you, Kara and Laura, um, uh, and, um, and focus on that self-care. Let's see if there's any questions that came in here. There's lots of appreciation coming in. If you do have questions, feel free to throw those in the Q&A. Oh, looks like there's one here. Um, to address transparency, is there data connecting the post-secondary graduates to the jobs they accept? Are the positions related to their degrees? What are the wages and can wages support paying back student loans? So Rachel, I think that's a really um, great question and one that depending on where you are located in the country, some of this data is available. Um, and it really is about how well a community or a school district or um, maybe it's state level um, systems are connected to like Department of Workforce Labor data. Um, these are definitely the questions we should all be asking. Um, there are researchers who are really dedicated to trying um, to understand this. And, you know, if you look at some of the things like the college scorecard and some of the databases that are available that tell you some of this information, um, the Gates Foundation has a brand new website that's out. And I can share these resources um, with Melissa and she can get them out to all of you. But the Gates Foundation now has a new um, resource that you can look at that actually measures that, that um, they've got a rubric that they came up with that looks at like the percentage of students who get jobs in the area that they're studying, what those wages look like compared to wages in other um, institutions, if a graduate, um, you know, from that institution compared to another one. So I think this is the move. This is where we're going because these are really um, important um, questions to ask. And I think we're going to see more and more of these MOUs getting in place. I know the state of California is just releasing a cradle to career dashboard that connects 15 state level, 15 state level data systems. So um, we will also be able to get this kind of information and it will connect back with every school district's um, student information system. So they will be able to have very specific information about their students. Um, really success in school, the courses they're taking, and how does that then align with both post-secondary choices and career um, attainment? So I see this in the future. This is where we're going. And I'm just going to add, because we as a university try to capture that data all the time, uh, to get information back from employers. Alumni is okay, but the employers is a really hard uh, just data point to get all together. I see lots of great resources being added into the chat for folks um, to um, take advantage of, and we will try to include that in our follow-up email as well. Um, as well, yes, Laura, uh, any resources you'd like to send, we can get that in the follow email, uh, email out to our attendees. Um, we are at five minutes um, past right now, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up with a huge thank you to our panelists today, Dr. Kara Aiva and Dr. Laura Owen. Um, I had the chance to hear from them, which seems like eons ago, just two months as the pandemic was kicking off in May with a, another um, initiative I used to run, and um, your level of knowledge and expertise in this area just never ceases to amaze me. So thank you for all the good work that you do. Uh, to support those who are supporting our students. Great to see you both. Thank you for your time today. Everyone, thank you for joining us today and uh, we will follow up soon with information. Thank you.